Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this sermon is from today's gospel reading from Matthew chapter 13. Jesus said, As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is our text. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends in Christ, walk into any garden center, and after the many varieties of plants and flowers and trees and shrubs, what is the main category of items for sale? It's aisle after aisle of products to make the plants grow and flourish. Plant food, fertilizer, compost, peat moss, all of these in countless variety. And then, maybe not so readily anymore, but there are usually weed killers, pest killers, poisons that get rid of anything that will harm the plants that you want in your garden. And what does all that tell you? That the world is not what it should be. It's not a place that automatically fosters growth and plenty. There are countless elements in our environment that war against a prosperous garden or flower bed, a vibrant farm or nursery or orchard. And you'd be hard-pressed to find any soil that is good by nature. Most soil needs added nutrients, fertilizers, manure, and compost. All kinds of additives need to be added in before it will produce healthy, vibrant growth. Generally speaking, without a lot of hard work and investment, it's all bad soil. So the words of Jesus' parable in today's gospel reading shouldn't surprise us. The sower goes out and sows the seed, and most of what the seed falls on are poor, is poor soil and difficult growing conditions. But Jesus gives us a beautiful explanation of this parable, and as he does, he connects you and me into the picture that this parable paints. As he puts us into this parable, we don't necessarily find ourselves where we want to be. He convicts each and every one of us of being, by nature, the bad soil that we are. First, the seed falls on the path. And that describes those who out and out reject the word of life. They are a growing number of atheists and evolutionists and worshipers of pagan gods, people who call themselves secularists or humanists and the like. They hear the word of God, the good news of the gospel, but they reject that word. Their stubborn refusal of God's gift of grace is external evidence of a hard and stony heart. Do you know anybody who falls into that category? Anyone who you have shared God's word of salvation in Jesus Christ with who rejects that word? Do you know anyone who refuses to budge from their sinful lifestyle and remains stuck in an unrepentant darkness? And is there any part of you that remains hardened against the Spirit's prompting to turn from your sin and live in the new life that Jesus holds out to you as a free gift? Then Jesus fall, talks about the seed that falls on the rocky ground. And that represents those who receive the word of life with joy. And they live in Christ with all the wonderful encouragement and hope that he gives. But that's only until someone or something comes along that contradicts what that word tells them. Or what they think it tells them. They're great until some trouble comes along that makes them doubt the reality of the joy of their salvation. And then that faith shrivels up and dies away. Do you know anyone who fits into that description? Everything is just great in their Christian life until they lose their job or someone laughs at them for spending their whole holiday on a mission trip or 
The person who first told them about Jesus is shown to be some kind of sinner, an embezzler, or a liar, or something else. They just stop coming to church then, or they cut their offerings in half, or they grow cold in their relationships with their church friends. Does any of that ring true for you? Jesus then talks about the seed that falls among the weeds. And that represents those who believe the gospel but can't let go of the things of this world. Entertainment is more important than deep scriptural truth. Having more things is more important than sharing more things with others. Being available for every shift is more important than making sure you can get to church every week or worship online. Does any part of that describe someone you know? Or does any part of that fit for you? If we're honest with ourselves, all of us are poor soil. All of us fail to be the fertile ground for the forgiveness, life, and salvation that are offered to us and to all freely through Jesus Christ, our Savior. But the parable doesn't stop there. Thanks be to God. Jesus goes on to talk about more than just bad soil, more than just all the sin and all the sinful people in this world. The parable continues with the seed being sown in good soil. Now, here is where most people expect to be told, now you try to be good soil. You work hard at being fertile ground for God to work with. You take the word and make beautiful, fertile plants for God. But when have you ever seen poor soil make itself into good soil? It can't happen. And in the same way, sinners can't make themselves good, just like those who are dead can't make themselves alive. Jesus came into the world to fix that situation. He came into our broken and sin-filled world, and he became what we can't become on our own. He became the perfect fertile soil on our behalf. He is the Word made flesh, perfect sinful flesh, and so as that Word, he is also the seed that falls into that perfect soil. And then on the cross, He took on himself our concrete, hard nature, our shallow, rocky selves, our weed-infested lives, and he became dead soil so that we would not be dead soil forever. And what does that parable say happens when the seed falls on fertile soil? It produces... And not just an average yield, it produces a hundredfold, or sixty, or thirty. What God does when God works is beyond belief. He brings out more bounty than we could ever imagine on our own. And he offers all that bounty to you and to me. Jesus, the perfect soil, offers himself. He gives us his perfect nature, to replace our sinful nature. He changes us from dead soil to vibrant, nutrient-rich ground. And this is all God's work. Praise be to God for the work he does in us through Jesus our Savior. Oh, we may not seem different to ourselves. We may not look any different to our neighbors, But we are different. We are transformed by the power of his word. We are made new creations through the water and word of holy baptism. We were baptized into his death, and with our resurrected Savior, we were brought out of death to life. Praise be to God for his work in us. And our Lord doesn't, he he doesn't stop there. He continues to do this every moment of our lives. He speaks to us his word, which the Holy Spirit works in us to move us to repentance. 
He works in us to turn our sinful lives around. He moves and works in us the power of God to amend our sinful lives. He renews us as the fertile soil that we are in Christ. And the Old Testament lesson for this coming Sunday tells it beautifully. The world looks at God's people and expects to see thorn bushes and poison ivy and weeds of all variety. But what does God do? He takes us sinful people and he makes us beautiful, sweet-smelling, life-affirming garden plants, rich with fruit, ready for service. And the result of God's work in us? Pure joy. Praise be to God for our glorious, life-giving God who works in us. Now, I encourage you to look at yourself now. Look at yourself through the eyes of faith that God has once again renewed in you today by the power of his word and through the forgiveness of your sins. You are God's masterpiece, fruitful branches connected to Jesus the vine. Praise be to God that he has transformed you and me into that vibrant plant. And look around you at those who may be worshiping with you as you hear this sermon today online. Or look around you as you sit in church and see your fellow Christians who are worshiping with you there. And think of all your brothers and sisters in Christ whom God has brought together into the fellowship of the body of Christ in your congregation. Look with the born-again vision that God has brought to you through his life-giving word. Each person in your fellowship, baptized into Christ, has put on Christ. Each person in your fellowship is a new creation through the powerful working of our grace-bestowing God. Think today of your brothers and sisters in Christ in this fellowship, in that light through the light of faith, the light of Christ, and see each other as the vibrant, fertile, God-made good soil, ready, eager, and bursting with God-given energy to produce the service that God has prepared for each of us to do. And God did not do all of this in you and in me so that we can just walk away and go back into being on the lifeless soil that we were before. God didn't pour out his Holy Spirit upon you through the power of his word so that you can go back to living through the devil-inspired power of this world. Now, some of you may be saying, but I'm afraid that is exactly what will happen. Because that's what seems to happen every time I start a new day. But listen to what Paul tells Timothy in his second epistle to Timothy. Paul says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. When he says through the laying on of hands to you and to me, that happened to you and me. In our confirmation, when the pastor laid his hands on us, it happened through you and to me when the pastor in our baptism made the sign of the Holy Cross upon our forehead and upon our heart as a sign that you and I have been redeemed by Jesus Christ the crucified. So he didn't give us a spirit of fear so that we would fall back into being shallow, stony, weed-infested sinners. And in today's epistle lesson, Paul tells us much the same thing. He says, you are all sons of God. And that isn't about your gender. It's about being heirs, inheriting all that God has put in his will for you to receive. And we don't have to worry about doing enough to earn it or working in our own way to get this to happen. Paul says that you have received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are no longer children of this world. No, we are children of God. 
We are heirs of his kingdom. We are members of his family and people who belong to him. Now, going back to the parable images, if we are now that good soil where God has planted his word, think about this. How often do you have to water new grass seed? How often do you need to fertilize the lawn? How often do you have to do something to get rid of the weeds in your garden? Well, thinking along those lines, go out from this time of worship, living the life that our Lord has put in you by his power. Be renewed in that power by your daily Bible readings, by your devotions and your prayers. Go out into this week bursting with the fertility that Jesus has given you for kingdom service. Keep that vitality strong by confessing your sins and hearing God's promise to you to forgive your sins because of Jesus' blood shed for you. Go knowing that Jesus, the perfect soil, has nourished you today giving you sure and certain victory over Satan and all of his tempting power. Go out claiming that victory and rejoicing that God has made you good soil through Jesus your Savior. In his name, amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.